welcome to my channel in this video we are coming to continue our discussion from the previous video where we were able to look at how to automate our accounting ledgers and extract a dynamic trial balance which we looked in our previous video so um, as you can see we're able to extract the trial balance which we can see here fully balanced like that and we're also able to prepare all the accounts within the, the accounting ledgers from these um, transactions as you can see here so that was what we did in our last video so in this particular video we are coming to move on from where we um, left off in that particular video so we're able to get to this particular point and at the end of that video i said that after you have extracted your trial balance what you do next is to prepare your financial statements and i also mentioned that one of the uses of the trial balance is not just to check the arithmetic accuracy of the various entries in your accounts or whether you have followed the um the double entry principle in preparing um these accounts but also it serves as a basis for preparing your financial statements all right and if you remember i said that this particular trial balance even though it balances and it is correct it doesn't provide us with enough information to prepare a full set of financial statements so because of that i have um a whole new trial balance here for us that we are coming to use to prepare our accounts for this um, particular soul trader all right so if you are very much excited to be here on this channel and to be enjoying this particular video please do not forget to subscribe to the channel and also consider liking the video and sharing it with others so they can also benefit and please do not forget to um, leave your comments in the comment section i'm very much interested in your comments all right all right so let's um start with what we have today so since we already understand what it means to have this trial balance how to extract the trial balance we are going to move right from that particular um basic foundation all right so we have um something there's something i want to add to this particular um trial balance now at the end of the period what happens is that at the end of the accounting period the um the accountant or the one who is preparing the financial statements will have to look at these um year end figures we call them the year end figures and see if there will be any changes sometimes at the end after extracting this trial balance the accountant will identify items or transactions that have occurred either at the year end or during the year which have not been captured in this particular trial balance and we call those year end adjustments all right we are they are called year end adjustments because they usually occur at the year end after the trial balance has been prepared all right so that is why we call them year end um, balances so those are some of the information that you see in an additional information at the bottom of your trial balance so these extra transactions that have occurred after we have prepared our trial balance are going to affect some of the some of the year end figures we see within our trial balance all right so just like that we have prepared our accounts we have extracted the trial balance now we want to prepare our financial statements but there are some items within the trial balance that need to be adjusted because an extra transaction has been identified or has occurred at the year end all right so that is what we are going to focus on so how do we integrate that into um the figures of the trial balance for us to properly present the financial statements that give a true and fair view of the affairs of the business all right so that is 
exactly what you are coming to look at. Now that you should um, know that financial statements are prepared on two fundamental assumptions of accounting. The first one is what we call the accrual basis or let me say accrual concept and the second one is the going concern all right the going concern concept so what is the accrual concept and what is the going concern concept the accrual concept is telling us that transactions okay in accounting the what you are saying we are what you are interested in is is whether an expense or an income has been earned an income has been earned or an expense has been incurred during the financial period and not when cash is received or paid that is the accrual concept now in this particular video i'm not trying to be technical i want to bring your understanding to the very basics because i have um advanced videos on this particular channel that you can go and search for so if you are already vested in accounting then i'll encourage you to go and explore those other videos all right but if you are new to accounting then i want you to understand what we do even within those advanced um concepts like um, how to prepare published financial statements which are quite different from what you are looking at in this particular video and also um, how to prepare the consolidated financial statements of a company all right with subsidiaries so that is what we um, that is the basis for what I'm doing here all right so I'm trying to bring your knowledge to the very basis that's why I'm trying to explain everything to you from the basis all right so the accrual concept is simply that expenses are incurred all right they are recognized when incurred and income or revenue is also recognized when um earned and not when cash is received for the income or um, cash is paid for the expense that is the accrual basis now keep this particular um, concept in mind because it is the other underlying assumptions it is the underlying assumption for preparing the financial statement that are coming to look at in this particular video and that is the reason why we have this adjustment here as well the second one is the going concern concept all right the going concern concept this one states that the business is expected to continue to operate for the foreseeable future so we are not looking um, at the business with a view that is going to um, wind up within the coming years all right is going to continue for the foreseeable future so as long as we can see the business is going to continue to operate into the future all right and that is the reason why when you come to the ledger account which we have done that is the reason why we have our balance brought downs and balance carried down the balance brought down here is indicating that this is the new balance for the current period all right so at the end of the of the month we balance of these accounts so the balance brought down here becomes the opening balance for the following month which means that we are expecting that um this particular business is going to continue in the following months all right or even in the following year depending on the um basis the, the the period we are um we are dealing with all right so that is the reason why we have balance carry downs and balance brought downs in balancing our accounts so where a business um is not applying the going concern concept then you will not see balance carry down and balance brought down within your financial statements you will not see them here rather you will see them being posted to either the balance sheets or the statement of profit or loss or the income statements straightforward all right that is another discussion for another period so that is what i want you to get right from the beginning so Understanding the accrual concept and the going concern concepts 
we can now dive into our question and then we'll see how we are going to do this step by step. So stick with me to the very end and then you're going to love every part of this particular video. All right. So quickly, let's um, design this. So in my previous video, I have already demonstrated how to turn off the grid lines in Excel so you can have a very uh, nice uh, background for your presentation. So we have Brenda. The name of the company is Brenda. Now we are now coming to read the question, but don't worry. Um, I just want to have something here. So this is what we have. I'm going to bold in that. And to increase, uh, I'm going to select everything here, the entire section here. And I want to increase the phone size to say 13. Okay, I think that is fine. And as we have seen, we are going to have the heading of the financial statement you are preparing. So, first we start with the name of the company, which this in this particular situation is Brenda. And we are going to have the name of the financial statement. Now, if you want to know which financial statement you want to prepare, quickly go to the requirements. Alright, so we are required to prepare Brenda's income statement for the year and the 30th June 20, um, year, year 6 and her financial statement, sorry, the statement of financial position as at that date. So I'm going to come here and then I'll write my income. So I'm going to have income statement, sorry, for the uh, year ended 30th. Sorry, 30th June year 6. All right, so we have that, and as we have seen previously, what I'm coming to do is to merge and center. But as I have demonstrated, instead of using merge and center, you can use this particular format cell. So, how did I come here? Let me cancel that. So, you just come to your alignment tab within your home tab of the, the, the ribbon and you come to the alignment and then you select this particular um symbol here which is alignment settings i'll click there or you can also hit control one to access that particular i format sales window and you come to the alignment section here and what you're coming to do is to select um horizontal and say center across selection i'll select that and then i'll hit enter and then we see that this has centered across the selection so i'm coming to edit uh, my financial my income here so this is income statement right there So let me redo that um, center across selection and hit OK. All right. So we have that. So quickly, let me, I want to delete this here. Sorry. So let me quickly delete this. So it stops interfering with whatever we are doing here. All right. So we have this. And let me quickly put this in a very nice format. So I'm going to format my color here, the color background to this particular blue. And also change my font color to white. Okay, it should be black. I think the black is fine. And I'm going to bold in that. All right. So, we have the name of the company. We have the name of the financial statement right there for us to, to do. So, let's go back to our question. 
and see what we've got here. All right, so we have the following trial balance has been extracted from the account of Brenda, a sole trader. So we have Brenda's um, trial balance as at 30th June year X, year 6. All right, so we know that the trial balance has a debit column and a credit column from our previous uh, video. So we have our sales as usual at the credit side. We have sales returns, purchases, purchases returns, carriage inwards, carriage outwards. Now, for, now you should know that all of these items are actually individual accounts that existed in the books of Brenda. All right, these are individual accounts that we have used to prepare the trial balance. So we have carriage outwards, wages and salaries, rent, heating and lighting, inventory as at 1st July year 5, drawings, we have provision for doubtful debts. So we have actually have some new items within this trial balance that we are we'll be talking about. For example, the provision for doubtful debts as well as our um accumulated depreciation items here all right then we have equipment at cost motor vehicles at cost we have their accumulated depreciation then we have trade receivables street payables bank sundry expenses cash and then capital as at first july year five then we see our trial balance balancing day then the following additional information as at 30th june year six is also available all right so we have this additional information four hundred dollars is owed for heating and lighting expenses seven hundred dollars has been prepaid for rent it is decided that a bad debt of one thousand two hundred dollars should be written off and that the allowance for doubtful debts should be increased to four thousand five hundred all right the precision is to be provided for the year as follows. Equipment at 10% on cost. Motor vehicles 20% on cost. Inventory at 30th June year 6 was valued at 16500 So the requirements, which you have already looked at, are preparing the income statement for the year as well as the statement of financial position as at that date. So that is the question for us. Now, as usual, I'm going to leave the a link to download the question within the comment section so you can download it and follow along whilst watching this particular video so um that said let's come to our financial statements and see what we've got so before that let me actually comment on some of the items you'll we'll be talking about before we prepare our financial statements so we can see some provisions here okay now the provisions are made because of the accrual and the matching concept now we understand what the accrual concept is the new one is the matching concept the matching concept is saying that um whenever there is we earn revenue whenever we earn revenue or we receive income that income should be matched with its um expenses all right or its expenditure so any expenditure we incur to earn an income or revenue that particular um expense should be matched against the benefits we are um incurring okay the benefits that we are reaping from the use of that particular of a particular asset or anything like that so that is what the matching concept is all right so it is all about matching revenues with their corresponding expenses that generated those revenues all right so that is it now we have provision for doubtful debts so as the name goes these are doubtful debts at the end of the period you have an account that contains your debtors all right so as you previously seen we had an account that contains our debtors or what you call receivables now what happens in practice is that at the end of the period not all of your debtors are going to pay you some are going to default all right it is some um, a normal thing that happens in business and so the accountants 
being prudent enough provides for such um, occurrences. All right, and that is what we call the provision for doubtful debts. So in the accounts, you will see a provision being made for um, your debts that are likely not to be received. All right, and there are various reasons why um, debtors, your debtors will not be able to um, pay you the amount they owe. All right, when the data becomes bankrupt, when the data becomes insane, all right, all of those um, factors can lead to the data not being able to repay your um, the debt they owe the business. All right, then a second one is depreciation. Okay, so by now you should be familiar with the word depreciation. Depreciation is simply spreading the cost of an a non-current asset, all right, a non-current asset over its useful life. So what you are saying is that the assets, the non-current assets, as we have seen, are not supposed to be sold within one particular um, financial year, but are supposed to be used in the business to generate revenue. And as the matching concept goes, all right, what you are trying to do is that because these assets are generating revenue, there is a need to allocate expenses to match that particular revenue that the asset is generating. And that expense is what we call uh, depreciation, which we believe is the, um, the drop in the value or the efficiency or the efficacy of the asset being used. So you are saying that at the period, at the end of the year, the asset being used to generate revenue might have lost um, value. All right, its value might have dropped. And so therefore we make a provision for that fall in value of the asset. And that is what we call depreciation. All right, so that is um, depreciation, a simple definition or a simple explanation for it. We'll get into the calculations and I'll give you more of those explanations. So I think that is the new things we have here. Then when you come to the additional information, what happens is that we have what we call accruals and prepayments. Accruals and prepayments. Now, the accruals are talking about expenses or revenues you have incurred or earned that you um have not paid for okay and so so what you're saying is that there are um accrued accruals and there are prepayments now an expense is accrued all right an expense is accrued if it is incurred in the accounting period but that expense has not been paid for all right so you have incurred that particular expense all right but you have actually not paid for that expense that is what we call accrual or expenses accrued expenses accrued all right so when expenses are incurred in a particular accounting period and that particular expense has not been paid for or no invoice has been raised then it is what we call an accrued expense i'm repeating it for you to understand all right then you should also know that accrued expenses are also called expenses in arrears expenses so you have incurred the expense so let's say you have um uh, you have outstanding wages and salaries yet to be paid to your workers. That is an accrued expense for you. All right. You have an outstanding rent that you are yet to pay for, for your business premises. That is what we call an accrued expenses. You have enjoyed the benefits. Okay. You have enjoyed the benefits. You have incurred it, but payment has not been made for that particular expense. That is what we call accrued expense. And the second one is the prepaid expense. This is the opposite of the accrued expense. With that one, with the prepaid expense, 
we are talking about you paying for the expense but you have actually not incurred the expense yet so that is the difference i hope you get the difference so the, the these two um concepts are treated specially within the financial statements and you are going to look at that right in this particular video so we have a lot to cover let's dive into what we have today so as we know this is the structure of the financial statements so quickly i'll come here and what we have is that we are going to have our three so first of all um we are going to have our um currency sign which in this case is the dollar so i'm going to put um three here for now and i'm going to select those and hit bold to bold in them and i'm going to format these a little bit to accommodate my figures so what i can actually do is to select those three um uh, columns there and then i can enlarge them simultaneously so all right so we have that and what i'm going to do is to select the entire portion here and i'm going to format it as an accounting with zero decimal places all right so i'm going to press this particular decrease decimal twice to reduce it to zero decimal places all right so let's start so as i said the question is in the video description so kindly download it and then you can follow along with me okay so so we have our first item here now what you should also know is that some of the items here will be recorded within the income statements others are going into the um the balance sheet or the statement of financial position now how do you know that this item is going to my income statements and the rest are going to my balance sheet so this is a simple way of determining that all right the income statement is simply your revenues less your expenses all right so any item that will affect your revenue or any item that is revenue and will affect your revenue will come into the income statement anything which is expense or will affect your expense will come into the income statement all right so that is how you determine it and if you are able to determine the items that are appearing in the income statement, then you know that automatically the rest are going into the um, statement of financial position or the balance sheet. Then when it comes to the additional information, what happens is that because these particular items are transactions which have not gone through the double entry rule system, which we, we saw in our previous video, we know that it is only the items in the trial balance that have actually gone through the um, the double entry system. Hence, the two sides, the two treatments of the transaction has been completed. All right. But when it comes to the transactions in the additional information, they have not gone through that particular system, which means that their double entry rules is outstanding. All right. It's outstanding. So what we do is that each of these items here, like all the other items within our trial balance are going to be treated twice in order to complete the dual um, concept the dual concept which is the double entry concept that for every transaction there are two sides to the account a debit side and a credit side all right so take note of that that each of the items in the additional information here are going to be treated two times because they have not gone through the double entry system which um the counterpart elements in the trial balance have gone through okay so just take note of that all right so the income statement presents all your revenues and all your expenses so the first revenue item here as we know is sales 
all right so i'll have my sales and what's the figure it's going to be 428,000. so i'll have my four in the second column i'll put it at the second column i'm going to tell you why so 428,000 right there and because i'm putting it the reason why i'm putting it at the second column here so actually let me format these three and put them at the middle good so we have that so the reason why you are putting it here because is because you are going to adjust this particular figure here and what are you going to adjust it by we sold okay as a business brenda sold goods worth four hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars at the um, for the financial year six okay so for the year six for the sixth year of her business she sold um or she made a total sales of 428,000. then what happened was that these particular sales some of them were returned all right after she has sold her goods some of the goods were returned to her maybe they were 40 or they were um overly supplied to the supplier and all that so they were returned back to the business and so to know the actual sales figure what you do is that we are going to less our those returns so we have our sales returns that are going to be subtracted from our sales figure to determine the true sales figure for the period or or the net sales for the period so we are going to have our 2000 here which is going to be negative all right now you can see a negative here because i've actually formatted my uh table here to be a negative figure so quickly let's check that what i did was i just selected this so holding my shift key i can come here and select the last one here and i'll go still go to my alignment or hit control one all right and come to number and i'm going to select um, number here and then as you can see i want my negative numbers to be in brackets all right it should be black and be in brackets and i want to have zero decimal places and i also want my numbers to be separated by comma when they are up to thousand all right so that's why i check the used 1000 separator here which is comma reduce it to zero all right and then also put my negative figures in brackets so i'll hit ok that is what i did for my figure to change into um bracket for me all right so having determined that i can come here and find the difference so quickly what i have to do is just to add these particular two items so i'll have here and here added together and that will give me 426,000. Now this 426,000 is what we we'll call net sales. All right, we we'll have our net sales there. So I can actually come here and put um uh, border at the top there. All right, so this is the presentation as you can see there. So uh, we have our net sales right there. Now the next item we will have after we have determined our sales as i said the income statement is about your income less your expenses so how did we come up with these particular sales or what costs did we incur to be able to make these sales and that is what we are coming to subtract from this particular um net sales figure and that is what we call less costs of sales less our cost of sales so what are the costs that were involved in making the net sales we have seen above all right so let me build in that so what our uh, our cost we made purchases the first one is that we made purchases all right we bought goods so let me remove that border there uh, no border all right so before we sold the goods we might have purchased the goods 
So the first cost of purchase, or sorry, the first cost of sales is our cost of purchase. So we have our purchases. So let me put it at the second place here. So we have our purchases. And even before the purchases, we might have if the, the business, this is the sixth year of the business, all right, which means that the business has been operating for the past five years. This is the sixth year. So it means that the business uh, might have inventory that have been left from the previous period. Okay, so from year five, we might have inventory which have left unsold. So that all forms part of our cost of sales and that inventory were previously purchased. All right, they were purchased. Therefore, they are forming part of our cost of sales. I hope you get it. So before, even before our purchases, we will have our opening inventory. They are calling it opening inventory because it is the opening inventory for the current period. But remember, it is the closing inventory from the previous period. You get that all right so our opening inventory how much is our opening inventory we can get that from our trial balance we can get that from our trial balance which is this inventory here inventory as at first july year five is fifteen thousand so quickly i'll come here and my purchases figure is three hundred and two thousand so quickly i'll come to my second column here and input my opening inventory of 15,000 and also have my 302,000 for my purchases right there okay then I can add that together using alt equals right there and then let me insert my bottom border right there good then after getting this particular value so this particular value is we cannot um, add or we cannot name it now Let's go to our um, trial balance and see if there has been any purchases retained. So after we have purchased the goods, just as sales may be retained, the same way purchases can also be retained. All right. So let's see if purchases are retained, which we have here, purchases retained of 1,000. If purchases are retained, then we are going to subtract them from our purchases figure, just as we did for our sales retained from the sales figure. So we we'll have purchases retains all right it's actually purchase retains and the amount so sorry so let me cut this and put it here and the amount involved is negative 1000 which is a minus there so quickly i can add those two together again so holding my shift i can select this an addition and press equals that is 216,000. Let me insert my border here. All right. And when we purchased, when we purchased, what happens is that we are going to cut these particular purchases or these goods to the business's premises. All right. We are going to cut the goods into the premises of the business and we are going to incur some carriage. Um, expenses. Once we are carrying the goods, we are going to uh, incur carriage expenses, and we call that um, carriage inwards in accounting. We call them carriage inwards. So we have carriage inwards here, which will be added to our purchases figure to determine the total cost of our purchases of our goods. All right. So we will have our carriage um, inwards right there. And the amount involved is 500. So we are going to add it because it's an extra expense on our purchases. All right, we are going to add that. So quickly, I'll come down here and I'll have alt equals holding my shift. I can select the second value and then we can add those together. And then also, let me insert my border there. Okay, so this is what we have here nicely done. Then, at the end of the current year, some goods might have remained in inventory. So, what we are saying is that at the end of the period, we had 
um, opening inventory from the previous period. We added purchases, we list purchases that we retained, and then we also add any expenses we incurred in carrying our goods that we purchased into the business premises or into our warehouse. And at the end of the period, we might have not sold some of the goods. And as the uh, And as the accrual concept goes, we have to um, only look at items that have been incurred, okay, for this particular period, for the current year. Okay, so those particular um, closing inventory are going to become the opening inventory for the next period, just as we have opening inventory from, um, as closing inventory from the previous period. All right, that is what we are going here. So actually, we are going to have our closing inventory all right and what we are going to do is that we are going to less it so actually you can have here less closing inventory okay and here to make things understandable we can come here and say add purchases less um purchases Retains and then also add carriage inwards. All right, this makes it a lot um, understandable. So we have our um, um, closing inventory less from our this particular figure. Now this particular figure here is what we call costs of goods available for sale. So good. So this particular um, um, item or this particular narration here is going to give you even more understanding. So after we have gotten our opening inventory, added our purchases, less our purchases returns, and added our carriage inwards, we will have our cost of goods available for sale for the period. Then after we have sold these goods that are available for the period, there is left an inventory or the goods, some of the goods have been left. All right, so we are going to subtract that closing inventory at the end of the period from the cost of goods available for sale. Okay, and that is what is going to give us our cost of sales for the period. So what is our closing inventory? We are going to find that amount within our additional information. It is always found in the additional information. All right, about 99% of the times you will see this particular value in our additional information because it is something we determined after we have prepared our trial balance okay so that that is the reason why it is always found here so we, we are told that inventory at 30th june year 6 was valued at 16,500. now remember there are various um, methods of valuing your inventory we have the fee for we have the leave for we have the um, average cost method and all that and some of the accounting standards do not permit some of the items for instance the um, IFRS accounting standards do not permit the LIFO method of valuing inventory all right but the US GAAP permits both the LIFO and then the FIFO methods so just take note of that that is also another topic for discussion for another day so we have our inventory value of 16,500 which is actually a less figure so I'll put it in brackets then we we'll have the value here to be equal to our cost of goods available for sale and then I'm going to add the negative 16,500 which is my closing inventory to get my cost of sales so I'll come here and write cost of sales so that gives me my cost of sales and let me put my border at the top here okay then uh let me remove it from there so let me undo and actually put it here and this particular cost of sales is a negative figure i want to make it a negative figure right there sorry so what i'm going to do is to put 
all of these in brackets okay then after getting our cost of sales which i'm going to highlight after getting our cost of sales you are going to subtract that from remember it is less cost of sales so i'm going to less it from our net sales which is the 426,000 there so our and then we are going to get what we call gross um profit we're going to get our gross profit and that will be equal to the net sales which you have here added to the negative cost of sales figure of 300,000 and that will give me 126,000 let me put my border at the top here and also bolden this particular figure right there okay so we move on now that you have determined our total revenue or total income which is the gross profit for the period we are going to less our revenue expenditure okay our revenue expenditure so this is just um, our sales and what resulted or what expenses we made to um, earn that sales revenue okay now we are going to look at the other expenses that the business incurred which are not related to our sales and our purchases directly so we are talking about administrative expenses selling and distribution expenses um and all of those other expenses that we are going to um in care in running the business all right all of those are going to be subtracted from our gross profits to determine what we call our net profit for the period so quickly we will have less revenue expenditure some might call it operating expenses is the same thing all right so when you see operating expenses or revenue expenditure remember that they are all referring to um the yeah, expenditure for the period so let me put my there so what we are coming to do is that we are going through the trial balance and we are going to pick every item that are expenses in nature now a rule for determining this is that you must always make sure um, um, remember that expenses have a debit balance in the trial balance they always have a debit balance in the trial balance so any item you see that you feel like is an expense should have a debit balance in the trial balance all right so take note of that so you are going right from the top to determine all the items that are likely to appear within the um, our revenue expenditure classification so our sales we've treated it sales returns has been treated purchases purchases returns has been treated carriage inwards has been treated carriage outwards so the first item here is what you call carriage outwards now what are carriage outwards as i said carriage inwards are when you um, buy purchase uh, you, you make purchases or you buy goods and you have to cut those goods into the warehouse of the business or the business premises and you incur cost that is what we call carriage inwards and such cost is added to your purchases your purchases for the period okay now when it comes to carriage outwards this is seen as kind of um a distribution or a selling or marketing sorry it says it's a, a distribution marketing and distribution expense for the period okay it's a marketing and distribution expense for the period and so it is a revenue expenditure you have made sales and that you have incurred this particular um expenditure in making that sale okay so it is a revenue expenditure that is why it is appearing here so carriage outsource is number one let's continue so quickly we can even be putting the figures right there so this figure will come i think uh the gap between these two figures uh is too much so let me quickly come here and delete some of the gap that we have there so i think this is okay let me also delete this extra space there good 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 so let's continue so we have 
um, our carriage outwards there and the amount involved is 900 the amount involved is 900 and remember it is at the debit side of the trial balance okay as you can see here this is our carriage outwards and this is the amount 900 at the debit side the next item there is wages and, and salaries wages and salaries are administrative expenses okay so our wages and salaries paid to the workers are revenue expenditures so we are going to have them right here so the amount involved is 64,000 right there so I can actually come here and also delete a bit of this okay so let's move on the next item on the list on the trial balance is rent so we we'll have our rent figure here and rent is 14,000 so let's just put the 14,000 there for now we we'll have light tin so we have heating and lighting sorry heating and lighting And the amount involved there is five thousand. We we'll have so inventory. We have treated it already. Drawings, drawings is not going to appear, even though it's at the debit side of the trial balance. It's not going to appear in our revenue expenditure because it is not revenue expenditure item. Okay, drawings, as we explained, is when the owner takes cash or goods from the business for personal use it does not contribute to our revenue generation therefore it is not part of our revenue expenditure okay so we are going to um, treat it under our capital section or the equity section because it has reduced the assets the net assets of the business which is our capital all right so we are going to treat that in the statement of financial position or the balance sheet now we have another one here called provision for doubtful debts so we have provision for doubtful debts the amount here given is um four thousand now you see it at the credit side that is normal for provisions provisions always have a credit balance um in the trial balance okay they always have a credit balance so don't be surprised that we've seen a credit balance here but we are putting it under our expenses there is a reason for that they always have a credit balance okay even though their expenses they are put at the credit balance this is an exception to the rule I have given okay the same thing applies to our depreciation expenses so we we'll have a depreciation and the non-current assets are two we have equipment i'll have my equipment here and then also i'll have uh let me quickly bring it here and then i'll have my motor um, vehicles as well then we have trade receivables which are not expenses trade payables are not expenses bank is not an expense sundry expenses so that one is clear sundry expenses okay and the amount involved there is eight thousand five hundred now as you can see i have not allocated any values to my depreciation figures because we have to calculate them okay we are yet to calculate them all right now that we have gotten all our expenses let's now go to the additional information what you should know is that the additional information apart from closing inventory mostly affects our expenses our revenue expenditures okay so that is where you have to come here and see which of the items or the figures need to be adjusted for okay so the additional information one is saying that 400 dollars is owed for heating and lighting expenses now when it comes to dealing with these particular items as i said 
their double entry has not been completed. So we are going to treat them twice. And treating them twice means they are going to be treated either twice in this particular statement, income statement, or the first treatment will appear in the income statement and the second will go into the um, statement of financial position or the balance sheet. Okay, so this is what we have. We have our 400 owed for lighting and heating expenses there and we can treat this in two ways we can use the double entry system to treat it or we can treat it directly on the face of the income statement okay now what we are saying is that per the accrual concept per the accrual concept we are recognizing expenses that are incurred and not expenses that are paid for okay in the current financial statements we are recognizing expenses that have been incurred and not expenses that have been paid for so if as soon as the expense is incurred for the current period we are going to treat it in the current period's financial statements so the 400 is old okay which means that we have incurred it but we have not paid for it yet and the payment for it does not is irrelevant in this particular scenario so what we're saying is that this particular figure for our light heating and lighting in the trial balance this 5000 is going to be increased by the 400 year because this amount we have found that at the year end that this 400 is outstanding it's an amount that has been outstanding we have already incurred it which means we have already used the heating and then the lighting system and we have incurred this amount but we have not paid for it yet so we are going to recognize it in the financial statement so the long and short of the matter is that whenever expenses are accrued or whenever expenses are outstanding or whenever expenses are in arrears at the end of the period we add it to the trial balances figure we add it to the trial balances figure in our financial statements okay so this is what i mean we'll come to lighting and heating so i'm here right here i'm going to have brackets and i'll have five thousand and then i'm going to add the 400 to it okay so quickly i can come here double click there input my equals and add my 400 to that figure and that will give me for five thousand four hundred as the full amount incurred for this particular period remember the amount incurred and not paid for all right so whenever there is expenses accrued outstanding or in arrears what we do is that we add it to the figure we already have in our trial balance all right the second is true or the opposite is true for expenses um prepaid all right so whenever there are expenses prepaid what you are saying is that we have paid for it but we have not incurred that expense yet so the expense is going to be incurred in the following financial or accounting period all right it's going to be incurred in the following accounting period and since it's going to be incurred in that period per the accrual concept we are going to treat it in the following accounting period and not this particular period so what you are saying is that included in this particular rent figure in our trial balance of 14,700 is relating to the following period even though we have paid for it in this particular current year it is relating to the next period because that is when it will be incurred all right so i'll come to my um my income statement and adjust that particular figure my rent figure of 14,000 so i'll come to here and sorry so i'll come to my rent and then i'm going to put brackets and then i'll have 14,000 and we are going to subtract the 700 since it's going to be rather included in the next period's um figure so we are going to subtract it so i'll bring my equals 
all right I have my equals minus 700 and that will give me 13,300 so you see how we are dealing with the issues here now let's go to the third um, additional information so what basically what you're saying is that whenever expenses are prepaid or expenses have been paid for in advance that's another word for it they have been paid for in advance what we do is that we subtract that particular prepayment from the figure in our trial balance all right from the figure in our trial balance so that is what we do the third one is saying that it is decided that a bad debt of 1200 should be written off so quickly bad debts are expenses to the business all right bad debts are expenses because um you are not going to receive the receivables that are being owed to you by your debtors okay so they are expenses so quickly i'll have my bad debts here and the amount there is 1200 so quickly i'll provide for that okay because it is decided that they want to provide for bad debts of 1200 in their period and that the allowance for doubtful debts should be increased to 4500 so we already have an allowance of 4000 in our provision for doubtful debts here as 4000 and what we are saying is that this 4000 should be increased to 4500 okay which means that the amount of increase is only 500 so that 500 remember this 4000 is what you have already incurred in the period it's what you have already incurred in the period you have we have done everything with it so the new balance here now is the 500 in our accounts so when i come to my provision for that food debt what i'll do is that i'll have my new period um the new balance that we are talking about which is 4500 okay and then i'm going to subtract the amount in my trial balance of 4000 right there so that i will have my difference which is the amount of increment only which is 500 so i'll come here and do just that so i have my equals 4500 minus 4000 and have my 500 as my provision for doubtful debts i hope that is also understood all right now let's go to our depreciation and see what we have there so depreciation as i already explained is um the fall in value of our fixed assets or the non-current assets over the estimated useful life okay so since the um, the non-current assets are being used to generate revenue for the period we have to match the revenue they are generating with the um fall in this value which is an expense okay which is a notional expense now remember division and provisions are usually book entries okay provision for doubtful debts as well as depreciation are book entries they are not actually cash movements that's why when you go to your cash um flow statements you will see depreciation being added back to your profit because it is a non-cash item okay that's just by the way so we are told that depreciation is to be provided for the year as follows equipment 10 percent on cost motor vehicles 20 percent on cost all right so quickly we'll go to our income statement and equipment is supposed to be depreciated at 10 percent so i will have my equals what is the um cost of my equipment so equipment at cost is 102,000. motor vehicles at cost is 44,000. so i'll have 102,000 and multiply that by my 10 percent which is 0 0.1 and that will give me 10,200 i'll do same for my motor vehicles which is 44,000 multiplied by 0 0.2 percent or 20 percent which is 8,800 so this is what we've got for our revenue expenditures i believe we have treated every item within the additional information so we are convinced that we are done with all the expense items 
So quickly, what I'll do is to come here and I'm going to have alt equals to add everything there together. So what I can do is to cut this and actually paste it here and put my border above this. So that is a matter of presentation. All right, you can present it in a way that you, you, you deem fit. Okay, then what you are going to do is to, because this is going to be subtracted, I will put it as total expenses. Or let me say total expenditure. Okay, total expenditure. That is the value there, and I'm going to make it a minus. So quickly, let me put my minus figure here and put that. Okay, so that um, when I add these two figures together i'll get my total profit so i'll have equals my gross profit added to the negative total expenditure of 112,800, and that gives me 13,200 as my net profit okay so in this particular scenario or this particular business it doesn't pay profit which is unlikely to be um to be the case in practice businesses always pay income tax all right so if there has been an income tax would have subtracted the income tax from um or it will have been added to our re revenue expenditures for the period and that will give us um our net profit for the period okay so that is the income statement quickly let me come here copy this format so let me actually copy this here so i'm going to copy that and then i'll come here and paste it for my balance sheet as well so i'll just paste that here and i'm going to edit this so we we'll have statement of prof um sorry statement of financial position so I have a statement of financial position as at now there is something you should notice here when it comes to the income statement we have income statement for the period but when you come to the balance sheet we have statement of financial position as at so what this means is that um the statement of financial position presents the um the position of the business at this particular date okay so at 30th june year six this is how the business looks like okay but when you come to the income statement it is for the entire year so all these transactions or all of these items you are seeing here are things that happened from the beginning of the period to the end of the period but for this one it is happening at this particular date only all right so take note of that this is an interview question they can ask you um, to explain why you have assets in the statement of financial position whilst you have four day in the income statement. all right so take note of that so this um, statement of financial position is prepared in accordance with the um, concept of the um, the accounting equation which we looked at so I want to align that horizontally center across selection of it okay all right so what I'm saying is that the statement of financial position is prepared in accordance with the balance sh um, the, uh, the accounting equation which we know to be assets which is a equals equity or capital plus your liabilities that is what we have there so we are going to have our total assets which we know are divided into non-current and current um, elements and then our equity plus our liabilities then liabilities which we also know 
to be divided into non-current and then current elements. So let's look at that and then we are going to dive, dive, dive into it. So we have the first item here to be non-current assets. Now remember some books or some others will use fixed assets. It's the same thing. Okay. So with the non-current assets, what we will have here is that we are going to have the costs of the assets. They are going to have accumulated, which I will shorten as ACC, depreciation, which I will just write as DEP apostrophe N, and we will have our net book value, which I will shorten as NBV, net book value. So we have cost, accumulated depreciation, and net book value. Okay, and then we can insert our dollar value here. So I can copy that across using Control R, and I'm also going to center align that. All right, so we have our non-current assets right there, which are bolding. Now, what are the non-current assets in this particular? Those are the assets that we have depreciated, and what are they? We have equipment and motor vehicles. So quickly, I'll have equipment. I have my equipment as well as motor vehicles. So in this particular scenario, there are only two. Now, when it comes to the presentation of your non-current assets or even all the items on this particular financial statement, the statement of financial position, or the balance sheet what happens is that uh, the items are arranged in order of permanence all right so you don't just see the items being arranged anyhow they are arranged in order of permanence that is for non-current assets so the longer they are expected to stay in the business um, um, those are the items you see being listed first all right, so assuming we had land, land you also you always see land being listed first, followed by premises, but usually they are combined. So you see land and buildings. Okay, so followed by buildings, and then you see um, machinery, machinery and equipment, and you see motor vehicles, then fixtures and fittings. Okay, so that's how it is arranged. They are arranged based on Permanent. So that's just a, a bonus tip for you. So just take note of that. When you see any financial statement, look at the non-current assets and see how they are presented. All right. And I'm talking about the financial statements of a sole trader, right? For companies, you will not see the individual items right here. You only see um, one item here called property, plants, and equipment. Okay. And I've covered the video on that in my, one of my previous videos on how to prepare financial statements in Excel in accordance with IFRS standards. All right, so you can check that out. So that's just by the way. So we have our equipment figure here. And from the trial balance, we know that the cost of the equipment is 102,000 as we've seen and calculated our current year's depreciation on, and um, the motor vehicle cost 44,000. All right, now let's come to the accumulated depreciation. The accumulated depreciation, as the name goes, is the depreciation of the previous years since the acquisition or revaluation of the assets. To the present period okay now the amount of depreciation or the amount of depreciation that is recognized in our income statements is the current year's depreciation charge is the current charge for the year okay so that is the depreciation that appears in the income statement so we do not use the accumulated depreciation balance as we have seen in our trial balance year 
in our income statements because these values have already been used in the income statements of the previous years. So you can't use them in our current year again. So when you come to the balance sheets, these two items, the accumulated depreciation for equipment since 2,500 and motor vehicles of 9,000 are going to be added to the current year's charge. And that will give us a total accumulated depreciation of the asset since its acquisition. So I'll come here and for my equipment is 22,500 and I'm going to add the current year's depreciation of 10,200 right there. And I'll do same for my uh, motor vehicles. So I'll have the um, accumulated depreciation of 9,000 from the previous year. And then I'm going to add the current year's depreciation of 8,800. And that will give me 17,800. Then the net book value, also known as the carrying amount of the asset, is equal to the difference between the cost of the asset minus the accumulated depreciation. Okay, so that is the current value of our assets in our books. So I'll use Control D to copy that formula down. And that is the total for both the equip equipment and the non-current assets. So I can come here and add these two figures together since all our assets are exhausted. So I'll come here and copy my formula across using Control R right there. And then I can come here and insert my border step. Okay, so that is how we deal with our non-current assets. So that is it. Quickly, the next classification of our assets is current assets. So from non-current assets, we go to our current assets. Current assets are those assets that are expected to be used up or consumed within one accounting period. Okay. And those ones we are presented according to their level of liquidity. They are presented according to their level of liquidity. So the less liquid assets come first, followed by followed by that, and then we go to the most liquid asset, which is usually cash. Okay, cash is the most liquid, it is a liquid asset, all right? So that is what we are saying, that we arrange the current assets based on their liquidity level with the less liquid assets coming first and then in that order. So the first current asset, which is less, the most less liquid asset is the inventory. So we have inventory. So we have our inventory here. Now, which value of the inventory are we going to use here? We have two inventory values. And if you remember from my previous comments on the additional information, I told you that every item in the additional information here is going to be treated twice okay it's going to be treated twice therefore let me see if there's any extra space here okay that's fine so that is the inventory there the next one which is less liquid comparatively is our trade receivables you have our trade receivables these are constants you can list them and then after that you can go to your trial balance and see if these items actually exist if they do not exist you can delete them off if they exist then you continue all right so we have trade receivables and then um we had provision for doubtful depth so let's put it here i'm going to explain this in a moment so provision for um, doubtful debts. And then the next one is our rent repayments. Rent prepayment. And then the next one is our cash. All right. So we have the first item here which is our closing inventory now as i said earlier each of the items within our additional information are going to be treated twice all right so the inventory 
year has been treated once in the income statement, which will be less from our cost of goods available for sale in the income statement to get our cost of sales. This particular in closing inventory here, which is 16,000, let me show that, 16,500 years. That's the first treatment. Okay. The second treatment to complete the dual concept is the treatment right here under current assets. So I'll come here and then I'm going to have 16,500. Okay. So that is it. Then I'll come to my trade receivables. What is my trade receivables figure? That is going to be affected by the bad debt. Remember, we are saying that the bad debt is the amount of receivables that we are unlikely not to receive. Sorry, the, it is the um the receivable figure that or is the amount of receivables that we are unlikely to receive. Okay, the amount we are unlikely to receive. So we are going to subtract that from our trade receivables to get our true receivables figure for the period. So what's our receivables figure? Trade receivables from here is 51,000. So quickly I'll come here and I'll have 51,000 and I'm going to subtract the bad debt amount of 1,200. That means that our bad debt is also treated twice. All right, it's also treated twice and therefore it has nothing um we have nothing to do with it again now let me cut this figure and bring it to the first column here sorry so um it is actually this one that i should cut so Control x and i can put it in the second column here Control v all right so this particular figure should be in the first column rather and what we are going to do is to less so less the provision less provision for doubtful debts and how much is our provision for doubtful debts we've been told that the allowance for doubtful debts should be increased to 4500 now it is this amount that has not been treated therefore we are going to treat it as it is 4500 so i have 4500 there okay and i'm going to put it as a negative figure and that is going to give me my true receivables figure of this amount added to my negative doubtful debt figure and that will give me 45,300. this is my receivables figure for the period i hope you understand it then quickly we go to our rent prepayment now this is what we are saying. The prepayment is actually seen as a receivable. You have paid for it, but you have not enjoyed the benefits or you have not enjoyed the services. So, if um, at um, or during the period the business that rented the premises to you decides to take its premises, the amount you have paid in advance will be given to you back. That is why you are calling it a current asset, okay? Because it can be converted into cash and you can receive that cash again, all right? So the prepaid rent, in this case, you are saying it is a current asset. Remember, all prepayments um, of expenses are current asset items. You should remember that they are current asset items. So when you prepay um, your expenses, you prepay for your expenses, then it means that amount is actually recognized as a current asset since you are you can receive that amount in the future okay now when you look at all of these figures they are all amounts you will receive in the future inventory is goods you have purchased for sale okay so you um, you are likely to sell them in the future and receive cash for them okay that is why we are classifying them as current assets our trade receivables you have sold the goods but you are yet to receive payments for them okay that is it and so this one too you have paid for it but you are yet to receive the benefits which means that if the benefit doesn't come or the services doesn't come then you are likely to receive your payments back so that's why i are classifying it as a current asset so all prepayments are current all prepayments of expenses 
are current assets. All accrued income are current assets. All um, prepaid, sorry, all prepaid expenses are current assets and all accrued income are current assets. The opposite is true for all um, prepaid income. If income is prepaid, it is a current liability and if um, expense is also accrued, it is um, a liability as well. Take note of those rules. All right. So our rent prepaid amount is how much? 700. So I'll put my 700 here. Then the cash can be found in the trial balance of, of relating to 500 cities. Sorry, five hundred dollars there. So as you can see, we have treated inventory twice. We have treated our doubtful debt and bad debt twice. We have also treated our prepaid rent twice. So we are done with those ones. It is left with our. Um, we have also treated our depreciation twice. Okay, so it's left with only the four hundred being the um, amount owed for heating and expenses lighting expenses which i said is a current liability item okay so having this i can quickly add these figures together using alt equals so I can come here and have my alt equals and using my shift and up arrow key i can select everything here and hit enter and i can actually cut this value and paste it here like that and i can uh, insert a border here insert another border here and then this the total non-current assets plus my total assets is going to give me my total assets so the total non-current assets plus the total current assets will give me my total assets, which satisfies the first part of the um, accounting equation, which is assets. And these total assets must be equal to your equity plus liabilities. So I'll have here financed by, and I'll have equity or capital. So in this case, it's capital. So let's use capital. And my capital figure can be found in the um, trial balance at the credit side of the trial balance, as we've seen in our double entry video. Okay, so the capital as at 1st July year 5, which is the starting um, capital for the year, is 121,600. So quickly, let me go here and type my 121,600 right there. And what we are going to do with the capital is that we are going to add our profit for the year. Okay, so we have our profit for the year. And that is going to be equal to the profit for the year, the net profit figure from our income statement. So that is 13,200 right there. So this amount are supposed to be at the last column, sorry. So they are supposed to be at the last column, sorry. So let me cut this using Control X, Control V. And let me also bold in this finance by item here. Okay, then what we do is that we can add these two figures together and as I said, drawings is coming here because drawings actually reduces the um, the owner's equity, okay, or capital. So you less drawings from this figure. Less drawings from this figure, and the drawings amount from our trial balance is um, twenty two thousand. Okay, so I'm going to put that for consistency. 
Let me put that as a negative. And then I can add this together now. So holding my shift, I can add this and then hit enter. Insert my border here. Alright, so that is our total equity and reserves. Alright, that's the total equity and reserves. Then we we'll have our current assets, current liabilities. If there were in this particular scenario, we do not have any non-current liabilities. Since we don't have, we can't see any loan that extends beyond um, or any liability that extends beyond one financial period. So we do not have anything like that. So straight forward, let's go to our current liabilities. If there were non-current liabilities, we would have brought them first before our current liabilities. All right. So I'll have our uh, boarding that. And what are our current liabilities? They include one, trade payables. So we have trade payables. Two, we are going to include bank overdraft. And then we are also going to include our accrued light heating and lighting expense and lighting expense okay so that is it for our current liabilities so as i explained earlier accrued expenses and um prepaid income are recognized as current liabilities okay whilst accrued income and prepaid expenses are seen as current assets all right so you should take note of those so what are our, our trade receivables from the question so the trade receivables is going to be 33,000 from our trial balance so as i said the question have to download it and follow along with me then Sorry, this is going to be 42,000 from our trial balance. And then our bank overdraft is a short term um, facility that is um, loaned to the business and is supposed to be settled within one financial year or even sometimes three months, six months. Okay, so it is within one financial year. So it is um, a current liability figure. Okay, and then our accrued lighting and heating. Which is found in our additional information is 400 i guess that's 400 right at the top here so that's 400 so now we have done everything here twice so we are done with everything that is in the additional information so i'll have my 400 there i'll hit my tab there and then i can add these together so i can have my sum select that and i'll come here and pick all of these close my parentheses and hit enter so that's seventy-five thousand four hundred. so this is actually three thousand three hundred sorry so let's go to our tribal and confirm that figure it's actually three thousand three hundred yes so our bank is 3300 it is at the credit side that is why we know it to be an overdraft all right because it's at the credit side a bank balance should normally have a debit balance okay so if it has a credit balance then it means it is an overdraft all right so that is it so it's actually 3300 day so my total current liabilities figure is 45000 700 and we can add that to our um total reserves okay of one one two eight hundred and that will give us one hundred and fifty eight thousand five hundred which is the same as the total asset here and this figure is called our capital so I uh, have capital and 
liabilities. And this is actually total capital plus liabilities. All right, and then I can double underline these two figures nicely. I can come here also and underline, double underline this particular figure as well. So this is how we prepare financial statements for um, sole traders. And um, this is how we prepare it within Microsoft Excel. Okay. Now this takes you to the very basics of accounting, basic accounting, the very basis. Okay. So thank you very much for your time in this particular video. This has been a longer video than I thought. I wanted to explain some of the things thoroughly so you can understand whatever we do in accounting. Okay. So it is upon this that we build the more advanced um, financial statements that you might see. Now this for that particular financial statement has been prepared based on generally accepted accounting principles and standards and concepts. So if you want to see how we prepare financial statements in accordance with um, particular accounting standards such as IFRS, then do check out my other video on how to prepare financial statements according to IFRS in Excel. All right. So thank you very much and I'll see you in my next video.